views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello, welcome to Open, the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime. Today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up, we'll discuss the recent resignation of NYP Commissioner James O'Neill. We'll talk with editorial page editor Michael Benjamin. Then we're going to sit down with radio personality and Open Monday host Bob Lee. He's discussing his upcoming Make the Grade Foundation Gala. And then... We're going to meet the author and activist and educator, uh, Redeem Ling, I'm going to pronounce her name right, Lady Le- Le- Yang, about the upcoming book, Cold War and Love. Pardon me on that pronunciation. And then guess what? We're going to discuss natural, tre- natural treatments, I should say, for thyroid disorders when we sit with the owner of Washington Heights Wellness. And BET is also airing a new docuseries, Cop Watch America. We're going to sit down with the founder of Cop Watch Patrol Unit, Jose LaSalle, an activist and organizer, Kimberly Ortiz. And after that, Harriet Tubman, the movie. Well, we're going to be talking about that. It's coming up recently and uh, a lot of controversy and great things to be said about it. We'll talk with the CEO of Harriet Tubman House, Karen Hill. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. I'm Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, November the 6th, and yes, you are watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, as Open is being broadcast simultaneously on MNN's channels. Now, you can also stay connected to us on all social media platforms at BronxNet TV. Well, some things have been going on through the past week. We're going to take you through a few of them with some Bronx updates. New York City's 13th District Representative Adriano Espiat held a town hall informing Bronxites of the impeachment inquiry surrounding President Trump. Our Bronx Net reporter, Darissa Wright, has the story as the congressman informed the public. The president, the vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for the conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. With all the impeachment talks surrounding President Donald Trump, residents in the Bronx are raising concerns and asking what it means for their community. United States Representative from New York's 13th District, Adriana Espiat, held a town hall detailing the impeachment process. I'm taking these types of meetings across the district and, of course, right here in the Bronx as well. And I think it's important that I keep my constituencies inform as to what we're doing in Washington throughout this impeachment process. Ed Yaker is a resident from the Bronx and attended the informational because he believes more local officials should meet with their residents in their district. Yaker said he's worried about what's coming next regardless of the potential impeachment. Whatever it is I'm worried because he has a base that is capable of anything and he is capable of anything. I'm worried that this man has the nuclear button because it's all about him. Like Ed, Bronx resident Loretta Ryan says she's also worried about the state of our nation, but appreciates events like these. Well, I think we're all worried about the state of the country and what behaviors may be going on. Uh, And it's a very volatile political uh, situation uh, right now. I think it's a, a critical moment in our history, and I appreciate the fact that the congressperson was coming out and talking with and 
hearing from constituents about this issue. So it's it's just vital. Impeachment inquiry proceedings comes to a head Thursday as the House plans to vote formalizing it. A two thirds majority in the Senate is needed in order to convict a sitting president and remove him from office. Reporting for BronxNet, Darissa White. And thank you, Darissa. The Bronx Borough President also held a press conference talking about the new redesign of the Bronx bus network. Our reporter Veronica Gitti was on the scene and she brings us that story as well. The fact is this, ladies and gentlemen, is that the, the bus service here in the Bronx, as you know, throughout the city of New York, uh, frankly put, is awful. And something needs to change. The borough president held a conference to inform Bronxites about the efforts of the new Bronx bus redesign coming from the MTA. A redesign has not been spoken about in decades, but the borough president commended president of the New York City Transit Authority, Andy Byford, and his team for implementing this change to provide new and improved bus services for their riders. We're really excited about the Bronx Bus Network redesign. We recognize that our existing bus routes here haven't been updated since the trolley days, since we took over the private lines, and we want to let everyone know that this has been and will continue to be a collaborative process. We held uh, many open houses, online surveys, many charrettes where we ask uh, bus customers to come in and help us redraw the lines. And you know, while this is a, uh, this is not the end, this is only a milestone, and we will continue to uh, you know work with our customers, work with the electors, work with our bus operators. We know we're going to get things right, and we know we might not get things all that right, but we'll continue to look at the data, listen to our customers' uh, suggestions, their complaints, and tweak it all along the way, so that everyone could be proud of this new Bronx bus network. One of the main Main changes of the redesign is to eliminate underutilized stops throughout the Bronx, which will allow for buses to move with the flow of traffic and get passengers where they need to be at a faster time. The average bus stop spacing in the Bronx uh, is just over three city blocks, far closer than bus stops in transit systems across the world. The redesign will take these bus stops to about 1,100 feet, considering factors such as stop usage, ridership, geography, and impact to the community. Andy Byford, president of the New York City Transit Authority, ended the press conference by saying that this is the new MTA way. The new Bronx bus redesign will not be made final without the input of the community. You can continue to stay updated on this news by visiting the MTA website. For BronxNet, I'm Veronica Guiti. And thank you, Veronica. And of course, stay tuned to us here at BronxNet. We'll continue to bring you all the latest when it comes to those Bronx Bus Network updates. Well, that's all the time we have for our Bronx updates. We're going to take a quick break. We do have more open, so stay with us. We're coming right back right after this. Patriotism it inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason, because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours is the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love, love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels.
And we're right back here on Open. Cold War and Love is a novel exploring what it meant to be poor and colored in the early 20th century. And for many, it was a time of imagination, a time of great hope, a wonderful time to be alive. But for others, it was rife with the struggle that only the strongest might overcome. And here now to tell us more details is human and women's rights activist and also the author of Cold War and Love, Rudine Ling Yang. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. God, I'm sorry for the <laughs> open too earlier, but I'm glad to have you here. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you were a press professor right here in the Borough of the Bronx. I was a, at Bronx Community College, right. professor of chemistry. Right, right. So, for, so, for, so for 30 years, right? Uh, yes, exactly. And so uh -huh. now you turn around and you take your talents <laughs> and now you go literary on us, right? Right, well, I did something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you write Cold War and Love. So right. give us a little uh, bit about the book. Okay, uh, this is a uh, biographical novel mm -hmm. based on uh, my grandparents who lived uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, my grandfather was a Harlem Hellfighter and he, he uh, fought under the French flag. His regiment fought under the French flag uh, during World War, World War I, which was the, they called the Great War. Mm -hmm. And um, they, you know, he, he, he went to war because uh, he had a job as a coal stoker, and he realized, he was 38 at the time, he realized he couldn't do that job much longer because he was getting older. And so then he told my grandmother, I'm going to war, and of course she objected <laughs> vehemently, mm -hmm. I'm going to war, and if I don't get back, they'll give you, uh, they'll take care of you, which was not really true <laughs> necessarily, but uh, he went to war, and he managed to survive. In, in, the, in your book, you talk a little bit about the Harlem Hellfighters. And right. For somebody who doesn't know about them, mm -hmm. give us right. a little bit of background. Okay. Uh, what happened is that New York State uh, established the first co colored regiment. They call it a colored regiment, the 15th Regiment. And um, when the war broke out, and these were all volunteers, when the war broke out, that uh, 15th Regiment was taken into the Army in one piece. And... Uh, when they got to France, they were uh, sent to France to fight, and when they got to France, they were called the 369th Regiment. And uh, that's where the men learned that they would be not fighting as part of the American expeditionary forces, but they would be fighting under the French flag. And what was the response like? Because I've always, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've, I've heard this before, right. and I've heard the stories, but what was the response like thinking that, first of all, you're fighting for a country as an African-American, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. and you're not even under the American flag. Right. They put you under the French, French flag. flag. What, mm -hmm. was, what was the mindset during that time? They were really upset because they thought they would join General Pershing's American Expeditionary Forces. And one of the men said, uh, I hope they don't use us for cannon fodder. And others said, is this the first time this has ever happened? They were asking my grandfather because he was an older person. He was 38. Maybe they were 18, 19, 20. And so this is the first time an uh, American uh, uh, regiment has fought o under a foreign flag. And they were very nervous, and they were upset. And so uh, they, someone, one of the men said, well, let's give the French a, a chance. Let's see what they have in store for us. And it turned out to be good because the French were less prejudiced than the Americans were. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they, the French had uh, suffered under the, uh, in the war for two years before the, Amer two, three years before the Americans came in. Mm -hmm. And so they had lost a lot of their men. So they were happy. They didn't care if they were black, white, green, or whatever. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You got a lot mm -hmm. of praise for your book as well. And I want to talk mm -hmm. to Dream Hampton, who's also the executive producer, and she's the uh, showrunner for Lifetime Surviving R. Mm -hmm. Kelly. Mm -hmm. And she's also the uh, executive producer for HBO's It's a Hard Truth. She says about your novel, it's a novel that mines her family history and takes it back on a journey through the late 19th and 20th centuries through Cape Town, Madagascar, and back to an intimate New York table. Right, <laughs> okay. So here um, we are. All right. What mm -hmm. do you want people to take away from your reading? I, I think I want people to uh, take away the idea of keeping a dream alive because my grandfather was taken out of school when he was 11 to uh, take care of the rest of the children. He was living in um, Lexington, Virginia. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, he always resented his father because of that, for taking him out of school, because he wanted to be somebody. And so uh, through, the, through the war, through his whole life, 
he wanted his son, which was my father, to go to college. And that was his dream. Even in the hellhole of World War I, he kept thinking about that. So, that. so keep your dream, follow your dream. You may have to flex it a little bit or whatever. And then the second thing is to uh, think, because a lot of times we react without thinking. So he was the thinking man of his regiment, because they were younger, they were impetuous, and he tried to keep them on a level ke uh, keel. Before we go, mm -hmm. Being poor and colored in the early 20th century, mm -hmm. right? The early 20th century, a challenging 1900. time. It's very right. challenging, exactly. Um, yeah. Give us a little bit of your reflections of what people had to endure during that time. Oh. Well, they had to endure the press calling them coons and darkies and things like that. So there was no, there was nothing there that was positive. They had no positive uh, images to look from. They weren't on uh, any particular good stage. And, of course, there was racism in hiring completely. My grandfather thought he would get a job in a factory, which is not a high thing, but uh, this is before the war. Right. But they, would not, they were not high in colors in factories. So that's why he had to take the job as a coal stoker in, at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. So it was prejudiced. It was negative press. It was, everything was negative and stock, sect against, stocked sorry, mm -hmm. uh, against black people. Right. people of color. Well, mm -hmm. We're going to leave it there, Redeem Yulet okay. Yulet Yang. Thank you so much for coming and sharing Thank with us. You. The I book is called it. Cold War and Love. We invite you to uh, participate. Get it. Now, the novel is available on Kindle and paperback on Amazon. And so, if you want more information about Rudine and her works, please visit tulipbudpress.com and you'll get all the information about there. Right. Definitely a great mm -hmm. read and definitely a great part of American history that you would want to know more about. Taking a quick break, we do have more open coming up. Stay with us, we're coming right back right after this. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes, but with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising, it, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> 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 so we're good? What? Oh, you still have pre-diabetes. Big time. And we are thanking you for staying with us. Make the Grave Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that's facilitating and encouraging academic achievement by implementing programs to tutor, mentor, and motivate some students, as well as providing incentives, as well as funding. And here now to tell us about the upcoming gala is the founder of the Make the Grave Foundation, radio, television, personality, and if you don't see him anywhere else, you can catch him right here on Monday. He's the host of Open on Monday. Dr. Bob Lee. We should title this segment with Monday Weeks Wednesday, right? There you go. That's it. Dr. Bob, good afternoon. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. Hey, always a pleasure to see you, you know. Hey. Uh, we, were, we were hanging out with last week. Yeah, right? last yeah. week, just last week. And, we got to be doing more of this, man. Yeah, and we say that because we don't meet up all the time. Right. Although People think that we actually show. do, right. and the reality is we don't really see each other often. Right. Well, it's always a pleasure. Man. It's always good to have you, man. Listen, yeah. so you got your foundation. Make the Grave Foundation, first of all. And in addition to all the great work that you're doing as a media journalist, 
Um, you said you wanted to create a foundation. So a little bit about Make the Grade. Yeah, it's in its 15th year. Whoa. <laughs> Uh, we started it based upon what we've been doing with the radio station. Uh, Percy Sutton, who started the Inner City Broadcasting Corporation along with Hal Jackson back in the day, um, got me to uh, go out to the schools, visit nonprofit organizations. So he said, uh, this is a good idea. This is a, a community thing we want you involved in. So I said, okay, I took on the task. And uh, in visiting all these schools, you see different things. And you say, well, how, how can I add to this? How can I help? So for many years, I was thinking about starting a foundation, the Bob Lee Foundation, the Dr. Bob Lee. I couldn't come up with the right name until I, you know, I was in a shower one day, and mm -hmm. huh, it came to me to make the great foundation for education. And what we wanted to do is put a number of people together in organizations. We called it, well, the mission statement is a, the collaboration between parent, teacher, student, community, clergy. We added financial literacy and health, and that's how we you know, we came up with the book, Seven Ways to Make the Grade, including mm -hmm. those seven things that I just mentioned. So you got a book out, of course, and not a, in addition to a book, you do a gala, and this gala is like a big gala that yeah. you do a, every year where you really honor, highlight, give scholarships, so it's coming up around the corner, but talk about the gala, because I know it's your pride and joy. Yeah, uh, December 5th at Terrace on the Park, it's going to be a big red carpet, a lot of people like to come down. They walk that red carpet, they take pictures, and they meet up with a lot of people that they didn't see in a long time. I mean, <laughs> Red Alert and, uh, and Funkmaster Flex were there. They were honored last year, mm -hmm. among other people. And people just mix and mingle. We have Supreme Court judges coming down and all kinds of people from all walks of life who are doing great things to help our students become successful. And talk about the impact that you've made with students, because we know a lot of students have been impacted, yeah. not just by the scholarships, but really just by the mentorship that goes all along with the Make the Great Foundation. A lot of people call me and call our organization. We mentor. Um, we just took on a, another group. I thought they were, they were brother and sister, but uh, when I, we did something for the Army. Um, that was a mother and son, but they both were dressed alike, and they both had the tie and black suit and everything. I, I said, wow, you know, but they came up to me afterwards and said, you know, my son really uh, likes you. He ins you inspire him, and uh, he was wondering if you can be one of his mentors. Mm -hmm. So I took on the task. We have a number of mentors and a number of programs that, that we get involved in, but most importantly, we would like to partner with organizations doing great things in our community because we figure, you know, it takes a village to raise a family, and that's why we came up with the seven things, uh, you know, um, the collaboration between parent, teacher, student, community, clergy, financial literacy, and health. We thought those seven things would help that student become successful. We have to grab organizations from, from our community to move in the same direction for a common cause in order for that student to help that student become successful. No one organization can do it alone. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And so for people who want to be a part of the upcoming gala, tickets are available? Tickets are available. They can go to makethegrade.org. Um, it's going to be a terrace on the park, November the 5th. December, right? Did I say November? December. It, it was in November, but it's December the 5th there every year. Mm -hmm. Well, not the same date, but it's in December now every year. Mm -hmm. December 5th, terrace on the park, yes. So you can go to makethegrade.org, and everything's right there on the website. Uh -huh. yeah. So for people who want to take part in this, listen, get a chance to, to be a part with Dr. Bob Lee, all these great celebrities. Uh, and I know you spend a lot of time with a lot of different people. One of your books actually uh, talks about great quotes from people. What yeah. are some of the things that actually stick out and some of the people that you meet that you're able to pass on to some of these young people? Because, you know, everybody yeah. says, hey, you know, you're always interviewing celebrities, stuff like that. What is your life lesson that you've learned from celebrities? So yeah. if I had to ask you that question, what would it be? Well, you know, I met up with just about everybody that you see on TV and hear on radio. Um, and everybody has something to say about something. But... What stands out is something very, very simple. Um, I was interviewing LL Cool J. We were in Brooklyn backstage at the Martin Luther King concert series. I said, what do you tell people who want to, um, you know, get into this business that, of ours? And he said, just do it. I, mm. And I was waiting for more. He said, no, just do it. It's very simple. Yeah, roll up your sleeves, you know. Find out what you want to do, stick with it, because when you stick with something long enough, something always happens. But right. make sure it's positive. I had the chance to meet Denzel, and years ago we talked, and, and same thing, I had to ask him a question. And I remember, because I still have the, I, as a matter of fact, I still have the interview. He kept I, it simple. He kept it real simple. <laughs> he, said, he said, but if you want to be uh, like, if you want to be like me, 
then be like me. Put the work yeah. in, work hard, yeah. And, yeah. And, and don't take no for an answer. Yeah. And, I, and I think very simply, you know, sometimes we look for these very profound statements, yeah. and it's real yeah. simple statements in life. Look, when you want to do something in life, you know, your mind incorporates thousands of ideas to help support you, what you want to do. And then God steps in and says, hey, let me open up a, a way for you. Right. You know, and then you start zoning, and nothing else can interfere. Nothing else can get involved, because this is what you want to do yeah. more than anything else in the world. And whatever comes along with that, you have to deal with it because you love this and you're passionate about this more than anything else around it. Why don't you passionate about December yeah. the 5th? There you go. Then we're going to make sure we get the people out. Thank there you go. And Doc, you're coming too. I'm coming. People always say, they say, you're coming too, right? I say, I'm yeah, coming. I'm coming. I'm coming, right? <laughs> no, but I am coming. Uh, there you you're go. you're my brother, so I am coming. There December you go. The 5th. All right, I want to let people know, Dr. Bob Lee, thank you so much for coming to be with us. MakeTheGreat.org. Go All ahead right. and check it out. Now check it out. You can always catch this man every Monday sitting in this seat Host it open. But for this particular segment, the Red Carpet Holiday Gala yeah. for 2019, the Make the Great Awards, yes, once again, Thursday, December 5th, from 6.30 to 11 at Terrace on the Park, located at 5211, 111th Street in Queens. Now, if you need more information to the gala, you can visit the website at makethegrade.org, yeah. and you get everything that you need. And, of course, you can visit Bob at the social media on Facebook at Dr. Bob Lee WBLS or Instagram, Doc Bob Lee. All right, taking a quick break. We still have more show coming up. We're coming right back right after this. So I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket again. It's like, hello, that's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide and go seek. out there let's stop what we're doing and take a moment a moment to be with our kids they can be loud moments goofy moments sporty moments dorky moments kooky moments moments when we talk or walk or just hang out it doesn't really matter they all count because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids well it's pretty momentous so let's all take a moment to make a moment today Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Well, on Monday, November the 4th, New York City Police Commissioner James O'Neill announced his resignation. Mayor Bill Blasio of New York City introduced a successor, Dermot Shea, who served under O'Neill as chief of detectives. The question is, what exactly does this mean for the NYPD? How does this affect New York City communities? And joining us now to share a little bit more is Michael Benjamin, associate editorial page editor of the New York Post, and we welcome Michael to the show. Michael, good to have you back. Thank you, Dan. Glad, glad to be back. Hey, so let's get right in it, buddy. Uh, well, let's, what are we to make, first of all, of the resignation of Commissioner James O'Neill? Is it something that we saw coming? Um, I think, you know, I've been talking to you for about a year or so. I've been telling me that uh, he would be leaving uh, for various, various posts. Now we know he is leaving, and he's leaving for a job as head of security uh, for Visa. You know, there comes a point, you know, when, when you want to move on. I think moving on now is, uh, is good for him. Um, creates opportunities for uh, other leadership, leadership in the uh, NYPD to, to come to the fore. Um, Dermot, both, both O'Neill and Dermot 
Pinochet, his, his, uh, his incoming commissioner, were uh, precinct commanders of the four four precincts when I was the when I was a member of the precinct council. So I know both as, as, as good police officers who care about the community. And uh, I think uh, passing the baton to Dermashe uh, is, is a good idea. I know there are those who think it's going to the third uh, white man in a row. I don't think that, that that's important. It's important. What's more important is their leadership and what they do for police officers and for the residents of New York who they uh, serve and protect. Well, when we talk about Dermot Shea, of course, not only was he uh, associated here in the borough of the Bronx with the 50th Precinct, uh, a lot of people have known him for his work there, uh, working here in the borough. What does he bring to the table now that do you think will be uh, to the benefit of New Yorkers? Well, he's, a, he's a younger than, uh, than, uh, than, than O'Neill. I think he brings that aspect of his youth with him, coming up in a different class of uh, police officers. Um, I think being not so much part of the uh, the, the, the old school or old, bo old boys network, I think that's important. Um, and having seen the work done by the two previous commissioners and wanting to move them forward and even, you know, uh, expand them, you know, doing more for uh, police community relations, you know, trying to hold crime down, you know, trying to let New Yorkers know that, you know, shootings are up. But we need to have police officers that are out there doing investigations and uh, and tamping down, uh, you know, on those sort of crimes. Well, according to New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, he introduced uh, Dermot McShay, saying he's one of the best prepared incoming police commissioners that this city has ever seen. And so, uh, when we look at him, are there any things that we can look at McShay, uh, the Dermot Shea's, uh, Commissioner Shea's uh, style? that we can see that will be translated on the streets or within the rank and file of NYPD? I think his style is a, is a quiet but assertive leadership. Um, he he uh, came into a police department that was far more diverse than uh, than, than time, uh, I think, when O'Neill uh, came into the department. Uh, I, I know he's committed, I believe he's committed to a community policing and working with the, the various communities of, of New York, not only for the we continue diversity among the police officers that serve New York, but also in, in how they carry out their duties and responsibilities in, in a respectful manner that still uh, allows them, you know, to, uh, to hold crime down. And he's also well-schooled in ComStat. Mm -hmm. So that's what you want. You want a commissioner who understands ComStat is willing and knows how to keep his commanders in line and making sure that they respond to uh, crime in the community and responding to what the crime stat data is showing so they can get ahead of, get ahead of it. And, you know, now... It seems crime seems to be committed by folks we know are, are repeat offenders and uh, and gangs, and to focus on them. Well, looking back, let's talk about uh, Commissioner James O'Neill. He leaves. Question will be, what exactly is the legacy that he will leave as commissioner of uh, the New York City Police Department? We know recently a vote of no confidence was given by the police union, uh, and some people say that that's a sign that the commissioner was doing his job. Yes. And, and unions are doing their jobs because their job is to protect and represent their members, uh, no matter what members do. Even those who uh, we, we see as, uh, as as committing some level of, of misconduct, you know, the union wanted to protect Daniel Cantalay, who they don't believe uh, used a chokehold and was responsible for the uh, for the death of of, um, of Eric Garner in, in Staten Island. Um, I think uh, O'Neill made a tough call and called for Pecaleo, uh, you know, to, to be terminated. He did what he had to do as, as commissioner. I think what his legacy is that he's been able to help keep crime down in New York, but also looking at focusing on where there have been spikes, spikes in, in, in rape, spikes in shooting, spikes in, in robberies in, 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 in neighbor, certain neighborhoods. And the neighborhoods where these crimes are occurring are neighborhoods of, uh, of, of color. And, and that's what uh, I think is important. It's not so much what the commissioner looks like or how they deal with, with police and relations. It's what are they doing to respond to crime in black and brown poor communities and making sure that those persons who are preying on our people are, uh, you know, are apprehended and, and put away? Mm. Well, we'll have to leave it there, Mike, but certainly we're going to have a lot to look forward to with Dermot Shea's administration and definitely looking back at Commissioner James O'Neill. Michael Benjamin, who is the associate editorial page editor at the New York Post, our guest here on Open. Thanks a lot, Mike. All right, thanks, Darren. Take care. All righty, taking a quick break. We've got more Open. Stay with us. We'll come right back in a few.
think getting dumped by text is harsh. Try getting dumped by a tennis ball. My ex owner drove me out to the woods, yelled fetch, and by the time I bought the ball back, he was gone. Yeah, I was pissed. <laughs> but the folks at the shelter helped me let go of my anger. I learned coping skills, like taking it to the hole. Boom! Now I'm ready to fetch again. But how about I throw and you run and get it? And we are back here on Open Washington Heights. Wellness is an integrative, oh, I should say integrative health care center empowering patients to lead a healthier lifestyle and achieve a higher quality of life through oriental medicine. Now, they recently held an event teaching self-care techniques for patients with thyroid disorders. And here now is sharing a little bit more is the founder of the event and the owner of the Washington Heights Wellness, Dr. Rosanna De La Cruz, and we welcome you to the show. Thank you. Good. Thank you and so, so for people who don't know a little bit about Washington Heights Wellness, please uh, give us a little background. So we opened about three years ago, and we have been helping many, many people, including people from the Bronx, since it's so close by. Right. It's on 187th and Broadway. Uh, we help people in pain. So I'm a holistic endocrinologist, which has to do with the thyroid disorders and the event that we just held uh, last Saturday, and uh, pain relief experts, so fibromyalgia, uh, herniated disc, sciatica. So that's our focus. And yeah. we have helped many, many people achieve a life full of pain, free, and, free of pain. And a lot of people, when, it, when they, they go through this battle, right? Because there's, you know, medicine that's prescribed by the doctor. Then there's a talk about using something naturally, right? And you come from a natural perspective. Yes. Uh, so talk to us about the natural perspective and, and how that's been effective. Well, I come from a family of doctors, including both of my parents. And uh, I see that conventional medicine has great solutions. And it's even better when we integrate it with natural medicine because we're able to allow the body to heal. Mm -hmm. The body heals itself. We can uh, focus on taking care of our body and making lifestyle changes as well as uh, dietary changes that can help us heal faster. And also uh, visiting a natural medicine expert that has dedicated their life to just help our patients do just that. Right, and you've got natural medicine and natural solutions to a lot of different, a lot of different illnesses. Uh, well, give us a little bit about some of the illnesses that you treat. Well, I, specifically, the, the last event that we held was around thyroid disorders. Mm -hmm. Most of hormonal imbalances as well as uh, pain are associated with high levels of inflammation. Uh, we all hear that uh, we have a lot of inflammation, but what does that mean? Inflammation is the body trying to defend itself against viruses or different type of mechanisms that go in the body. So when we talk about uh, the thyroid disorders, we're talking about inflammation, hormonal imbalance, and in most cases, poor blood circulation. So we focus on the root cause of the problem to help the, our patients heal from the root cause, not only the symptoms, but um, we know that health is not only the physical aspect. When we're not feeling well, we know that our emotional well-being is in play, also our mental well-being, and we cannot even socialize with people the right. same way when we're not feeling well. well. Acupuncture, oriental medicine, two of the things that, that, are, that you use and, and two of the things that we hear a lot about. Uh, give us a little bit of more background for somebody who may not know about acupuncture or oriental medicine and how that works in the natural realm. Well, we have many, many scientific studies now with over 100 conditions that are proven to be a safe and effective treatment for pain and, and hormonal imbalances. We can list all of those, but people, what people really want is to feel better. Mm -hmm. So acupuncture is a modality in the oriental medicine category where uh, we look at the patient individually. We don't really look at the disease only, but we're looking at each patient the way they are because we know whether it's insom insomnia, headache, or any disease, it doesn't affect each person the same. So we want to focus on each person individually. And acupuncture and oriental medicine has been around 2,000 years before conventional medicine. So now it's coming here to America, but many, many countries have been using it for many years. So if people want to find out more information about natural versus conventional medicine, 
um, you know, and they walk through and they walk through your doors. What are some of the things you should tell them to kind of like ease the fear? Because there's a little bit, it's a little bit of an unknown, right? We don't we don't always know. We know we know that there's out there, but we don't know all that comes with it. So, what do you tell people when they're interested in finding out more information about natural medicine? Well, the first thing is that we always want, we know that the body heals itself. Right. So natural medicine, that's the foundation of natural medicine. And then it's very important to be aware of conventional medicine because we cannot ignore the fact that we need it. And right. it is very important to integrate both. So we focus primarily on making sure that the patients, let's say they're taking medication, we don't actually go against conventional medicine. We integrate both of them because it's necessary. Somebody that suffers from hypertension, diabetes, they can continue on their medication and still uh, treat the root cause of the problem. So eventually they will uh, feel a lot better. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming, doctor, and sharing a little bit. And of course, thank we you. give people the information to get connected to you. Yes, uh, right. Washington Heights Wellness, 187th and Broadway, or acupuncturelocal.com. She thank said you. her best. Now, listen, if you want to learn more about Dr. Rosanna De La Cruz's natural self care techniques, please visit their Washington Heights Wellness Center. If you want to know the address again, it's 4386 Broadway Avenue. Now, for more information on upcoming events, you can also visit their website at acupuncturelocal.com or by email at acupuncturelocal at gmail.com. All right, stay tuned. We got more open coming up. We'll be right back right after this. 150 over 90. 180 over 111. 160 over 110. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it, or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. And welcome back. Cop Watch America is a docu-series dedicated to bringing awareness to their community and exposing police brutality. The Cop Watchers, they fight every day to protect citizens, amplify the truth, and keep abuses of power in check. We're taking a quick look right now. I do this because I'm a mom. I do this because I'm black. I do this because what's happening now, it's fucked up and it needs to be stopped. Dismantling that whole law enforcement body can only be done by out organizing them, can only be done by out strategizing them. I'm Shabana Newsom. My name is Nupal Kiazolu. My name is Hulk Newsom. I'm Kim Ortiz. My name is Jose Lasalle. My name is Prince Akeem. And I cop watch. I've been an activist since I was 12 years old. And so I like to consider myself a young veteran. I'm seven years in the game. Basically, I got involved with Cop Watch through my protesting for Eric Garner. Well, I've been doing it since 2011. So it's been like almost eight years that I've been um, doing Cop Watch. I don't leave my house without this uniform on, without my Cop Watch shirt on. When I went into law school, I was originally thinking about becoming a corporate lawyer, but two classes touched my heart, criminal law, constitutional law. 
That's when I realized how this country oppressed my people and how they used the law to do it. And joining us now in studio, telling us more of the founder of Cop Watch Patrol Unit, Jose LaSalle, and activist and organizer Kimberly Ortiz. And good to have you. Thanks thank you. Thank me. you for having us. Congratulations. Thank, thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> What's it like seeing your work, first of all, actually make it to the big screen and, and, and the impact that it's having? <laughs> so um, I was really shocked that they even wanted to um, film us doing Cop Watch. I was really, really happy about that. Um, it's controversial for some reason what we do. So the fact that we were given this platform, I think, is um, a testament to the times that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. And there is some controversy to it. Let's just be honest. I mean, you know, you're out there filming police. You're filming things that are going on. A lot of people feel like, you know, police shouldn't be filmed or it shouldn't be that, it shouldn't be that intense. Let them do their job. And you say what? Yeah, listen, man. We know that police is out there doing what so-called what their job is. But we also know that police, especially in community of color, is being very aggressive when they uh, detain or stop somebody or question somebody in the community of color. And we want to make sure that we show the other side that people are afraid to talk, the other side that people uh, has not seen. And we want to bring that to the surface. And we want to make sure that people see that there is another side of policing that takes place in community of color that is different than the policing that takes place in a white community. And we want to show that difference. I think, you know, viral video after viral video after viral video, it proves that um, it's necessary and actually vital that we continue to document these interactions. Mm -hmm. And so for somebody who asks the difference between like Cop Watchers, Black Lives Matter, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you make that different differentiation? So, you know, for us, um, we're direct action. Well, NYC Shut It Down, you know, works really closely with Cop Watch Patrol Unit, but we are uh, abolitionists and we're direct action. We're out on patrol actively, you know, um, cop watching. So um, I'm not sure that that's the same case with um, BLM. They do their work um, differently. They approach um, activism differently than, than our groups, I think. Cop watch is also a lifestyle. You know, in order for you to be a cop watcher, it's not just taking out a video camera and recording and becoming a videographer. A cop watcher takes a lot of tactical and a lot of studying the NYPD because those are the ones that we're going after, the ones that are not following the proper procedures, the ones that are now abiding by the NYPD patrol guidelines, and the ones that think they could go into a, a color community and treat people any way they feel like it or treat everybody like criminals. And this is, and this is what makes a cop watcher. And it's an everyday thing because I leave my house with my cop watch uniform. No matter where I go, I have my cop watch uniform on. And it's important for people to understand that it is not, it's not just you know, a one-day thing. This is a lifestyle. This is part of a culture now. And we have to do this every single day because community of color is being under siege and attacked every single day by aggressive policing. You're in episode three right now, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, uh, and so talk to us a little bit about what we can expect for the rest of the season without giving it away. Um, obviously, you've got a, a full season ahead of you, but give us a little bit of insight. So um, <laughs> just, you know, given the nature of um, the work, there's definitely drama mm -hmm. in the series. Um, you know, our work is intense and um, it gets deep sometimes and, you know, people don't always agree. So there's definitely drama. You'll definitely see some really powerful um, protests, you know, around the Eric Garner stuff because, you know, we were filming through the summer and that was, you know, when the Pantaleo trial um, was happening. So you'll see a lot of that. And... Um, you'll see a lot of us cop watching and some drama. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, the thing is, you know, we're a family. Kim, I love her. I, you know, I kind of picked everybody to be part of my cop watch group and it wasn't easy. And when I see her and the way she was doing activism, I said, she's going to be a great cop watcher. And, you know, I, you know, I brought it into the family as I did every other cop watch that is a member of the CPU family. And, you know, and, through the whole cop watch thing and family, we always gonna have controversies between each other. We always gonna disagree, and there's times we're gonna get <laughs> real hardcore, you know, on disagreeing with one another. And, and these are things that you're gonna see in the episode, which is gonna be interesting. But it's also the way I'm saying, you know, real life is. It's real. Right. Ultimately, what do you want people to take away after watching the series? Cop watching can't be ignored, and it is everybody's duty, especially if you're a person of color. Um, in our communities, we're usually told, mind your business, keep your head down, mind your business. Now, if you're in my community, you are my business, and if I see a police officer interacting with you, it's my duty to stop and make sure that you're going to be okay after that. 
And it's important for us to realize that we got to have each other's back. As people of color, we have to stick together. We have to have each other's back. And especially in a community where people's voices are being drowned out, it is our duty to make sure that we bring those voices to the surface. All right, Kim. Jose, thank you so much for coming to be with us. Cop Watch, want to let you know. You can check it out. Thank you much. And uh, let you know, listen, Cop Watch America, airing on Wednesdays, 11 p.m. on BET. Now, if you want more information, you can visit copwatchcpu.com. Once again, copwatchcpu.com. And, of course, every Wednesday on BET at 11 o'clock. All right. And if you want more information on Kimberly and Jose, you can also visit them on social media at Copwatch Kimmy or a Cop Watch Patrol Unit. Don't go anywhere. We've got more open. Stay with us. We're coming right back right after this. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold, the angry giant! Behold, the angry giant! It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. The Harriet Tubman Home Incorporated is an independent not-for-profit established by the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church to manage and operate the homestead of Miss Harriet Tubman. On November the 1st, the Harriet movie was released honoring Tubman's life as an enslaved person in Maryland, her escape from slavery, and her role in the Underground Railroad. Joining us now to tell a little bit more about the details is the president and CEO of the Harriet Tubman Home, Karen V. Hill, and the pastor of the Mother Amy Zion Church in Harlem, the Reverend Malcolm J. Bird, and good to have you both. Thank you. I think I know you Thank pretty you. well. Yes. Good to have you. Yes. And so it's got to be, first of all, Karen, a good job um, for, or I said, great time for those who love Harriet. And being the CEO of the Harriet Tubman Home, knowing the Harriet movie is out, give me just your reflections. Well, it's a wonderful time for the Harriet Tubman Home from the standpoint that we operate her 20, her 32-acre homestead in Auburn, New York. So we're open year round, so visitation is way up. Everybody's super excited. But what's more important, I believe, is that the movie amplifies the theme of her core values, the first among them being faith. Mm -hmm. And you cannot see that movie and not recognize the value of faith in the liberation struggle. I mean, that, that, that's just powerful. And liberation in all sectors is what we focus on at the Harriet Tubman Home because while we are so happy that her campaigns to bring the enslaved freedom seekers north was portrayed in the film, we're even more excited now that we'll have opportunity at the Harriet Tubman Home to tell the story of what the free Harriet did for 54 years. And uh, Pastor, I know that you had the opportunity to be a part of the screening, right? Indeed. And mm -hmm. so give us your reflections your take back from seeing the screening and what it meant for you given the fact that she's a part of the denomination and so much of a part of American history. Indeed. Uh, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, uh, I was a part of a group of about 100 persons, actually it was about 300 persons, but Focus Feature Films allowed an opportunity for about 100 persons associated with the church and the Harlem community to go to the Schomburg to view, to view the movie. 
Now, as a historian myself, I'm watching the movie and seeing how uh, the writers were able to contextually weave uh, the faith narrative, the liberation narrative, uh, at the same time. It was an incredibly moving, moving picture. Uh, my mother and my sister have already seen it three times already. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's a tremendous film, uh, and it's a film that's beyond question uh, one of the best I've ever seen. So where did it go from here after having such a great film? Well, you know, the drum continues. You mm -hmm. know, everybody who sees the movie hears the drum right. of what are you going to do to rise up, okay? Rise up and seek your liberation and seek your freedom, okay? We know that for seniors, making sure you get that you age in dignity and grace, that's mm -hmm. a part of your freedom struggle. Mm -hmm. For all of America, Harriet had the John Brown Hall, which was an infirmary, mm -hmm. which provided free health care to everyone, so access to health care, mm -hmm. very important. Harriet uh, grew fruits and vegetables and had uh, animal life on her property to deal with people who were food insecure. So food insecurity is your issue. What are you doing in your community to address that? Harriet was an entrepreneur. So if you're a woman and you want to go into business, you take from Harriet that she learned how to fire those bricks on a kiln she built in our property and was able to sell those bricks to fortify the other uh, part of her humanist movement activities. And as a part of liberation, she was central to the women's suffrage movement, mm -hmm. okay? She was one of the few women, actually the only woman of color who could, or and whites cannot go into these convention halls and articulate this message, to articulate the need for women to have the vote, even though as states were extending the right to vote to women, they were taking the, the, the vote away from black men. But she could actually weave that. And if you see the film, you also see how she challenged up the abolitionists, Indeed, right. okay, because she said she lived through slavery. Mm -hmm. The others are abolitionists because they believe it's wrong, but she lived what was wrong mm -hmm. and knew what needed to be done. We'll leave it there. We're going to have you come back on Perspectives, and you're going to be a guest talking a little bit more about Harriet the movie. We've got Karen Hill, the Reverend Malcolm Bird, pastor of the Mother Amy Zion Church in Harlem. Listen, for more information, you can visit the website at thehariettubbinhome.com. Unfortunately, we come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all our guests for joining us. Most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recable Cast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum's Channel 67, Verizon Files Channel 33, or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. That wraps it up for us here on the set of Open. I am Darren Jaime saying take care. God bless. Be sure to keep this channel wide open.